Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt. This, oh my gosh. This video has been a long time coming and it was fraught with frustration and perils and hardware bugs and software bugs and poor driver installation and a lot of hurdles. But I have a really amazing piece of kit that I want to show you from Cooler Master. And that is the EG200. This is not a mini ITX case. This is a uh, chunky Thunderbolt enclosure. Let's take a look. All right, so I just reviewed the Asus ProArt B550 and I've got this system set up here on the table so we can kind of talk about it. This is Thunderbolt 4 and Intel goes out of their way not to tell you about the chipset or any of its stuff. This is Maple Ridge. Thunderbolt 4 and Thunderbolt 3, there's not really a lot of difference between them. There's still 40 gigabits of bandwidth between Thunderbolt 3 and Thunderbolt 4. The standard is really around power delivery and what the requirements for display are. Thunderbolt 4 is gonna have a little bit better uptick with um, VR. I think Intel engineers were a little surprised when VR headsets didn't immediately adopt Thunderbolt because you know, the vision was, hey, it's 40 gigabit, it can do display, you can do USB, you can do power delivery, all over one connector. Uh, but over that time, you know, we went through three revisions, basically, of the Titan Ridge chipset. There's a lot of hardware bugs there. A lot of bugs with uh, Thunderbolt around, uh, <laughs> around security. Because um, Thunderbolt is a direct memory access technology, and anytime you have a peripheral that can do direct memory access, and you have a Thunderbolt peripheral on laptops, you know, all of a sudden it's pretty easy for somebody that's well-funded to build a device, say, for example, that would plug into a Thunderbolt port on a fully locked down laptop, but could dump the contents of memory. In the contents of memory, you can find all sorts of fun things like encryption keys, uh, you know, crypto wallets, if you have cryptocurrency, there's all sorts of fun things that you can find if you're able to do that. So direct memory access is a dangerous thing. And Intel has layered on a lot of security in Thunderbolt 4, well, in, in Thunderbolt leading up to Thunderbolt 4 um, with varying stages of backward compatibility. I say all of this because when you pick up Thunderbolt, if you don't have a great experience with Thunderbolt, it's probably because the device ages are a little too mixed. If you've got an ancient device that's got Thunderbolt and you pick up a new Thunderbolt enclosure, it can be a little problematic. But the EG200 has been one of the best Thunderbolt enclosures that I have ever tested. So for our ProArt B550, this is an AMD based system and you figure that AMD is going to be a little bit more challenging on the Thunderbolt side than Intel. Only slightly, only slightly because of the aforementioned chipset revisions, but yes that is otherwise true. This is Maple Ridge, as far as I know, one of the first implementations of that Maple Ridge Thunderbolt controller. This is Titan Ridge, this is the third revision of Titan Ridge this in this particular one. Um, but is basically a flawless experience. So with a Thunderbolt enclosure, it doesn't make sense to deploy a really super high-end GPU because you're limited to about 40 gigabit. Really, it's about 32 gigabit of PCIe bandwidth. So it's PCI Express 3.0 by four. Really, that's like GTX 3070 or Radeon 6700 XT levels of performance. And it changes a little bit depending on if you're gonna use the external GPU to do the rendering and then send the rendered image back over the Thunderbolt connection to say like for a laptop use case. For a desktop use case, something like this doesn't make sense for displays usually. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but for laptops or other small form factor devices that have Thunderbolt, if you have a device that has a built-in display, you do lose a little bit of bandwidth from that transaction. And that's why it's like, was it 32 gigabit or 40 gigabit? Well, that's the USB side of it and some other stuff there for display bandwidth. You do lose a little bit of PCIe bandwidth, but it's not quite as catastrophic as you might imagine. You really should look for benchmarks that have both kinds of benchmarking, but I digress. For a laptop, plug your monitor into this. Cooler Master envisions that you're gonna use this basically as a docking station. There's one important point that's different. Cooler Master knows that we're kind of in a bandwidth constrained scenario and that gamers and enthusiasts are gonna want an enclosure like this. So rather than split the USB functionality that's on the Thunderbolt wire from laptops and that kind of thing, they actually provide a second USB 3 connection here 
and then three USB type A ports, as well as a SATA dock in the front. How cool is that? You can put a SATA SSD up here or a mechanical hard drive, but for your games that don't play well on a laptop, you can actually store those on an external GPU like this, and you really don't lose too much, especially if it's just a SATA SSD that you're working with. I mean, yeah, you, you lose some performance if, if you're running something from NVMe, but if you put in, you know, like a one or two or four terabyte, uh, you know, SATA SSD in this thing, or you run all your games from a mechanical hard drive, this is a great solution. The worst thing about it is having to plug in two cables, the Thunderbolt cable and the USB cable to your laptop. But this thing can also charge. So you can charge your laptop through this connection. So only two wires into a laptop, it's pretty good. And check this out. You got a shelf on the side, so you can stand your laptop up vertically here. That's a pretty awesome solution. So for testing this, in addition to the ProArt B550 and Intel laptops of varying generations, and also Threadripper Pro, yes, Gigabyte has a wonderful Threadripper Pro motherboard with Thunderbolt, well, at least the option for Thunderbolt. It's got the Thunderbolt header. I added a Titan Ridge controller and it worked great. It's awesome. And that controller also supports power delivery because you can add PCI Express power to that add-in card and that works fabulously with this external enclosure. So this opens up a lot of possibilities in terms of you need an FPGA accelerator card or something other than a GPU that you're using with the Threadripper Pro, you can do that with this and carry it around. That's pretty awesome from a visual effects standpoint. For rendering and mining and things like that, 40 gigabits uh, is not really a bottleneck. You're not, you're not bottlenecking there because the GPU is doing most of the work and the GPU is doing most of the work from its VRAM. So it's not really a big deal that you've got, you know, Thunderbolt 3 or Thunderbolt 4 limiting you to the 32 slash 40 gigabits per second of bandwidth. Uh, basically PCI Express 3.0 by four lanes worth of bandwidth to the interface. It doesn't, doesn't really matter in those cases. And a lot of peripherals other than a graphics card will work in this. Now Cooler Master doesn't officially support that, but it does work pretty well in my experience. There's two other things that I really like about this closure. One, it uses a standard SFX power supply. If the power supply dies, you can just pop a new SFX power supply in there. Kudos for standards. That is worth a price premium in my book because that, may, that means this thing is gonna have longevity long after the Thunderbolt protocol is obsolete. The other thing is that it's got one 92 millimeter fan here, but you can add a second fan. We've got some of those Noctua 92 millimeter fans. We could pop a second one in here and we've got an extra fan header on the little sort of mini PCI Express motherboard breakout that we have down here, which is really, really awesome. So if you wanted to add a second 92 millimeter fan, you totally could. In terms of like the physical parameters, uh, for the dimensions of a graphics card that Cooler Master recommend, those are on screen. And I'll recommend, you know, nothing nicer than a 6700 XT or 3070 Ti-ish if it fits in those parameters just because of your bandwidth limitation. A 3080 is not gonna make sense in this at all. You've also only got two eight pin power connectors, but there are some empty modular cable connectors on the power supply that was in this. So, I mean, you could go off script here and, you know, add a bigger power supply and, but you don't, you don't, there's no need, don't do that. One other thing I'll mention you might be thinking about is if you're using Founders Edition versions of the NVIDIA card, remember that the air passes through on the back. So that's gonna dump a ton of hot air directly into the power supply, but the power supply has its own fan and exhausts through the top. So that actually works out okay. That's been a quick look at Cooler Master's Mastercase EG200 with the Titan Ridge controller. I've tried it with Maple Ridge and Titan Ridge and Alpine Ridge. I've been, well, actually two different revisions of Titan Ridge. Titan Ridge the third revision, Titan Ridge the second revision. I'm so sorry for you if you have the first revision of Titan Ridge, my, my condolences. It should work, it should be fine. It's just a little, it can get a little weird with like the DCH drivers. Oh, driver installation is the other thing. Uh, for the Thunderbolt control, you gotta get that from the Windows Store now, not Intel's website. If you go to Intel's website, it's basically like, okay, the drivers are here, but these are basically from 2019. You need to just not use these. So you can download through direct links from Cooler Master, but ultimately you're gonna get a Thunderbolt control software actually from the Windows Store. Um, that control software is problematic on older controllers that are rocking older firmwares. So if you do have like one of those second gen Titan Ridge controllers, you're gonna wanna make sure that the firmware on it is fully up to date. And as an end user, like if all of this sounds like a foreign language, I am so sorry. This is where we are with Thunderbolt. We can't, you know, bother to engineer software that, 
you know, pops up and says, oh, hey, I'm the DCH driver from the Windows Store. I've detected that your controller is running an older version of the firmware, and it's not from an OEM that has asked me not to update the firmware. So I would like to either walk you through updating the firmware or, you know, give you a link to update the firmware or just handle updating the firmware myself. You know, this kind of software engineering is apparently impossible in this day and age. So the end users must suffer. But hey, level one's here to help you, right? I'm Wendell, this is level one, I'm signing out. You can find me at the level one forums if you need tech support or you just wanna take pictures and show off your setup because this is pretty cool. I'm signing out and I'll see you there.